Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters, your Magic the Gathering source that helps you command your budget. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. Hey everyone, Mitch coming in from the Commander's Core Studio. Welcome to the show. Today's episode comes to you courtesy of Michael, who's been supporting this channel as a general tier patron. I truly couldn't do this without the support for amazing patrons like Michael, so again, Michael, thank you so much. And for the personalized deck tech, Michael chose Time Luminous Enigma, focusing on graveyard recursion with small creatures. Time Luminous Enigma is a 3 3 nightmare beast that costs 1 white, black, green. It has each other creature control enters the battlefield with an additional vigilance counter on it. And by paying three, you remove three counters from creatures you control and put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard, then return a permanent card with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So Tyam is an absolute value engine. By getting counters on creatures, including those vigilance counters that Tyam dishes out, we can utilize those with Tyam's ability. Milling three gives us access to more and more permanent cards in our graveyard. And then we can get any of those permanents back as long as they've got a converted mana cost of three or less. So like Maldrotha, our graveyard with time is somewhat of a second hand. We can use and abuse a lot of powerful effects with this commander. We can get permanents out of our graveyard, get them in play, sacrifice them for value, and do it all over again. Once things get going with this commander, it's gonna be really hard to stop. So first up, let's talk about how we can set things up with this commander and then start generating a lot of value. A key piece to this deck are going to be sacrifice outlets, specifically sacrifice outlets that cost 3 or less. Again, by having a converted mana cost of 3 or less, time can get them back when we need them. So we're going to be running some fantastic sacrifice outlets like Viserysir, Carrion Feeder, and even Fame the Broker. Viserysir is a 1-1 vampire wizard that has sacrifice a creature, Scry 1. When it comes to sacrifice outlets, a free one makes a big difference. We can sacrifice creatures whenever we need to for value. And while scrying isn't card advantage, it is card selection, so it can help us ditch dead cards off the top of our library. And then Carrion Feeder is a 1-1 that can't block, but by sacrificing a creature, we put a plus also encounter on it. This very well might be the best sacrifice outlet in our deck. Again, our commander needs counters for its ability. So Carrion Feeder can sacrifice creatures for value, and while it's doing that, we can also get counters on it to then use for time to get more creatures back. In a similar way, Fane the Broker can also be very effective. It's a 3-3 that has a lot of abilities, so here we go. Tap, sacrifice a creature, put 2 plus plus 1 counters on target creature. Tap, remove a counter from a creature you control, create a treasure token. Tap, sacrifice an artifact, create a 2-1 white and black inkling creature token with flying. And by paying 3 and a black, we untap Fane the Broker. So Fane can actually help us out in multiple ways. First off, obviously that first ability can be very impactful with this deck, being able to sacrifice a creature and get two counters on another creature. Also, there will be situations where you want to remove a counter from a creature we control for a treasure token. Once we're set up, we're going to have plenty of counters in play, and actually some of those counters want to be removed, but we'll get to those here in a bit. So yeah, Fane can be very flexible and very impactful in this kind of a deck. Next up, let's talk about a creature that doesn't need a sacrifice outlet to get extra value out of it. It's Steve! Sakura Tribe Elder, better known as Steve, is a 1-1 Snake Shaman that has Sacrifice It, search your library for a basic land, put that card onto the battlefield, tap, then shuffle. So yes, although Sacrifice Outlets are needed to get extra value out of a lot of creatures in this deck, it's not needed for Steve. Because Steve can essentially sacrifice itself to ramp us, and then with time we can get it back. To have Steve sacrifice himself again to ramp us! Thanks, Steve! But a Sacrifice Outlet is needed for a card like Spring Bloom Druid. It's a 1-1 Elf Druid that when it enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice a land. If you do, search your library for up to two basic land cards, put them onto the battlefield, tap, then shelf your library. So this is essentially a hero on a body, and again with a sacrifice outlet, we can keep getting extra value out of it. Next up, there's Devoted Druid, which helps us ramp in a different way. She's a 0-2 Elf Druid that taps for a green, and by putting a minus one, minus one counter on her, we untap her. So essentially, she can tap for two mana in a turn, and again, while that minus one, minus one counter is usually a downside, for this deck, it's actually an upside. Because again, time can take that counter away and utilize it to get something else back. So yeah, Devoted Druid can help us out a lot throughout the game. 
But next up, we've got a Mana Dork with Skull Prophet, which can help us out in multiple ways. It's a 3-1 Human Druid that can tap for either black or green, or we can tap in mill too. So yes, this can help ramp us, but it can also basically generate card advantage for this deck. Again, like I mentioned before, our graveyard is somewhat of a second hand thanks to Tyam. So Skull Prophet can either tap for mana or give us access to more and more cards. Speaking of which, there's Seder Wayfinder, which when it enters the battlefield, we reveal the top four cards of our library, then we can put a land card from among them into our hand and the rest into our graveyard. So this can give us a land off the top while also milling us for three. Or if there isn't a land, it mills us for four, which is great for this deck as well. And of course, again, we can sacrifice it and get it back if we want to mill further. And when we do sacrifice this with a sacrifice outlet and we sacrifice other things as well, we gain a lot of card advantage from things like Grim Harvest Backs. Grim Harvest Backs is a 3-2 human wizard that has whenever another non-token creature you control dies, draw a card. So by sacrificing creatures, not only do we fill our graveyard, but we also fill our hand when this is in play. Yeah, like I mentioned before, Sacrifice Outlets can be very impactful in this deck, especially with value engines like this one. They can also be valuable at helping us abuse ETBs like Reclamation Sages. It has, when it enters the battlefield, you may destroy target artifact or enchantment. So if there are pesky artifacts or enchantments in play, we can keep getting rid of those by getting this back into play. Or we can get rid of other permanents with something like Plague Crafter. It has, when it enters the battlefield, each player sacrifices a creature or planeswalker, each player who can't discards a card. So a card like Plague Crafter is fantastic in this kind of a deck because it essentially just, you know, gets rid of itself. We get it in play, all of our opponents have to sacrifice a creature, and we just sacrifice the Plague Crafter. And again, with time, we can keep getting it back when we need to. And then there's Plague Boiler, which can help us get rid of a ton of things at once. It's an artifact that says, at the beginning of your upkeep, put a Plague Counter on Plague Boiler. By paying one black green, we can put a Plague Counter on it or remove a Plague Counter from it. And when it's got three or more play counters on it, we sacrifice it if we do destroy all non-land permanents. So Plague Boiler can help us out in multiple ways. Obviously, the first way is that if we need to, we can let those Plague counters go up, and then all of a sudden we can get rid of the entire board. But if we don't need to get rid of the entire board, we can utilize the counters on it with Tyam. One free counter return can really add up throughout the game. But if we do decide to, you know, blow everything up, we can really utilize a card like Dauntless Escort. It's a 3-3 Rhino Soldier that has Sacrifice Dauntless Escort. Creatures you control gain indestructible until end of turn. So this is recurrable protection for our entire army. So yeah, this can help us get out of some tough spots, and it can also turn Plague Boiler into essentially a one-sided board wipe. But now let's move on and talk about some more ways to get counters that time can utilize. First up, there's Evolution Sage, which says whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, proliferate. So basically, when we do that, we can choose any number of permanents and or players, then give each another a counter of each kind already there. So if we've got counters on a lot of our things, we can essentially just double those up just by getting a land into play. And again, we've got creatures that have ETBs that get more lands into play, so we can really utilize those and get a lot of counters on everything. Another way to help fuel time is with Anafenza Kintree Spirit. She has whenever another non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, bolster one. So you choose a creature with the least toughness among creatures you control, and you put a plus plus one counter on it. In a similar way, there's Good Fortune Unicorn, which says whenever the creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus plus one counter on that creature. So again, these are essentially free ways to get additional counters in play. And the more counters, the better for time to utilize. Next up, let's talk about some types of cards that are fantastic at producing counters for this deck. First up, there's Promise of Bunray, which says whenever a creature control dies, sacrifice Promise of Bunray if you do create 411 color spirit creature tokens. This simple three mana enchantment can be very impactful in this deck. If one of our creatures dies or if we sacrifice a creature with a sacrifice outlet, we have to sacrifice this and then we get four spirits. Again, thanks to our commander, each of those spirits comes into play with a Vigilance counter on it. So with this one permanent, we get four counters. And you know, also four tokens. So then we can utilize three of the counters on those tokens and activate time, and if we want, we can just get this back. Then we sacrifice another creature, we get more tokens, and you see where this is going. It's kind of like a counter token engine for this deck. And then other fantastic counter producers for this deck are cards that have Undying or Persist. Young Wolf is a simple 1-1 with Undying that has, when this creature dies, if it had no plus plus one counters on it, return to the battlefield under its owner's control, they plus plus one counter on it. So essentially, if we sacrifice this, it comes right back into play with a plus plus one counter on it, and thanks to our commander, a Vigilance counter on it as well. And then if we utilize time to remove those counters, well, we can sacrifice this again and get it right back for more counters. And then Persist works in a very similar way. Kinchin Sphinx is a 3-2 oof that has, when it enters the battlefield, you gain two life, and it's got Persist. So it's essentially the exact same thing as Undying, but with minus one, minus one counters instead. So you sacrifice this, and it comes back into play with a minus one, minus one counter on it, and a Vigilance counter on it, oh, and you gain two life. 
So again, time can utilize those counters, then you can sacrifice this again and get it back again and gain more life again. And actually, cards like these can go infinite if we're set up correctly. Which leads us to the golden pigs of this deck, and yes, usually there's only one golden pig, which is the top card of the 99, but in this case, there's two, and you'll see why here in a second. Anyways, the golden pigs of this deck are Cathodian and Priest of Ginks. Cathodian is a 3-3 construct for 3, and when it dies, we add colorless, colorless, colorless. And then Priest of Gix is an older card, so I'm going to read its Oracle Tax. It's a 2-1 Phyrexian Human Cleric Minion, and when it enters the battlefield, add black, black, black. Yes, they added Phyrexian to this card, and no, it probably wouldn't fit on the line if they actually had to. Regardless, for this deck's purposes, each of these cards essentially do the exact same thing, and that's why they're both the Golden Pig, because they're both incredibly powerful in this deck. They essentially each give us three free mana that we can utilize to activate Tyum. So if we're set up correctly, we can essentially go infinite with them. All we need is a free sacrifice outlet and ways to make counters to fuel Tyum's ability. And again, we've got plenty of ways to do that in this deck with persist creatures and undying creatures, etc, etc. Regardless, if we do go infinite, we can easily drain our opponents out with things like Zulport Cutthroat, Corpse Knight, or Passion of Remembrance. Zulport Cutthroat says whenever it or another creature we control dies, each opponent loses one life and we gain one life. Even if we're not going infinite, we have the ability to drain our opponents out very quickly with this. And then Corpse Knight works in a similar but different way. It says whenever the creature enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses one life. So this one drains on ETB, which is pretty much just as effective for this deck. And then Bastion of Remembrance is an enchantment that can also help us out. When it comes into play, we get a 1-1 white human soldier creature token, and whenever a creature we control dies, each opponent loses one life, and we gain one life. The amount of value that this deck can generate is absolutely absurd. And even if our opponents deal with some of our key pieces, well, time can just get them back. So once we're set up and we've got things going, it's going to be really hard for our opponents to stop us. And then when we're ready to finish them off, we can easily do that as well. Again, a huge thank you to Michael. I had an absolute blast building this deck. If you're looking to play this deck, consider joining the amazing Play EDH Discord. It's a great way to play Commander over webcam. In the description below, you'll find their Discord invite link, as well as the tier that this deck has been approved at next to the deck list. So if you want to pick it up and play it as is, you can, and be sure to read their welcome information for more details. And with that, this show is coming to a close, so it's my turn to hear from you. So in the comments below, let me know what your thoughts on this episode are, and as always, thanks again, and have a good one.